during the year of the cross. In the epistle reading you just heard that Christ was of such a nature as us that he was suffering all the sort of things that we suffer in the fallen world. And therefore, it says that he can understand our own sufferings. In other words, he's not separated from us by any sort of um, created way or some sort of other creature or something like this. But he is one of us and suffered like us. He was thirsty, he was hungry, he was whipped and, and felt pain. He felt sorrow for those who died. And all those sorts of things that we go through in this world. People write to me and they say, Why is it that we commemorate the cross? Christ was killed with a gun, will we commemorate the gun? It's not a bit of a question which really means that the person asking it does not understand the whole history of salvation. For one thing, the cross is something eternal and very common to us everywhere. You see it in window panes about every architectural situation. Wherever you go, you see it. Just outside there, we have this beautiful spider. It's called the St. Andrew spider. And on the back it has a, a cross turned on the side, the way St. Andrew was crucified. And it spins the most wonderful web. And there are flowers and nature, and all sorts of things. And if you look carefully, you see the cross. It's something so common to us that we take it for granted and we don't even um, see it many times. And we have this cross that we are supposed to be carrying, as Christ said, referring to our difficulties in life whatever they might be, and however they might be. You see, the cross is, okay, you can look at it as a tool on which executions were performed, but it's also an element which tricked the tricky devil, who thought he was so smart, he could outsmart and now trick anybody. Because he was the one that inspired those around Christ to crucify Christ because he wanted his soul into Hades. He couldn't get it any other way. He couldn't get it by tempting him. And if you listen carefully to the reading of the epistle, it said he was tempted in all the things that we are tempted with. Hunger from thirst, sexual desire, comforts, pleasures, all those sorts of things he was tempted with and gave in to none of those. And so the devil thought, well, okay, he's a man, he's pretty good ascetic, you know, but I'm going to get him when I have him killed. And as I've said to you many occasions before, that the cross that they used was not some random wood chosen somewhere but was the carrying boards of the Ark of the Covenant which was kept in the temple and it had been there for thousands of years and it had mystical properties because it, would, it was like it was alive shrink and grow and do all, do all sorts of things like these. And the Pharisees, the Shabchisees and the high priests of that time didn't like this thing. 
And so they use that to crucify our Lord with. Get rid of it once and for all. It was buried after that and lost for many years until it was recovered by St. Constantine's mother. Now we have parts of the cross in virtually every Orthodox church in the world, including ours, on account of the fact that no matter how much you take from it, it grows back. So it's a living, mystical thing. And you can't see it, do that, you can't witness it, because those things are hidden from our eyes in account of our sins. But to us, the cross is that by which we obtain our salvation because when we go through difficulties that's where the Lord expects us to thank Him from that and to bear that cross faithfully. You see, we always pray the Lord show us how to be saved. We always pray, lead us to salvation. Sometimes by a way that we might understand is um, um, bearable and whatever, but quite often by a cross, by some sort of difficulty, because it evokes within us the passions that we didn't even knew existed, but they live there. And sending this cross to us, that passion, that those passions are evoked. We therefore have something to work on to save ourselves. Come to confession. If you've got nothing to confess, then obviously you haven't noticed those passions that have been invoked in you by your difficulties. What's the point of having confessions if you've got nothing to confess? What are you going to repent of if you have nothing to repent of? The passions are wide and deep and long. And in a sense, exist almost to an infinite extent in a person. No matter how much you, with the help of our Lord, fix them, they still live in you and at any time can burst open and surprise even yourself at what you end up doing that you thought could never happen to you. I often um, read about or hear about even ordained people married with a family and whatever and they might travel somewhere or something like that and end up falling for another woman or something like this. That would never in mind to do something like that. Ever. And yet it occurs. And that's why we need to take particularly care of ourselves. That's why we wear a cross. Ourselves. And that's why we treat the cross as if it were some sort of living saint. And we ask that that cross first of all be something that we are able to bear and that it helps us in salvation. That it shows us what's wrong with us and that way we can work upon ourselves and repent and ask God to forgive us for those things seen or unseen which live in us often unseen. If you've ever read those little pamphlets that we have there about the trials that a person was diagnosed through. Some call them the toll houses, although I don't like that particular name. It gives you an excellent list of those sort of passions that can live in you. And you might read them and say, okay, this, 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 this applies to me, this does, but this doesn't. This doesn't, this doesn't, this does. I, give, I 
put it to you that every one of those applies to us. It just it hasn't been invoked yet. But if you are truly seeking salvation, they will be evoked in you. And then you will see for yourself the fallen nature of your own self and how you have to repent of that. So therefore, under all these difficulties, thank the Lord and ask Him particularly to be able to see why He sent you that difficulty. Why? What is it that lives in you that you haven't yet figured out but that is of a sinful nature? What is it? Ask the Lord about that. And you see that He will reveal that to you. And you'll have something to confess, something to repent of. And it may not happen just like that. It may take time. Sometimes years. Sometimes you may not even be able to put it to rest in your life. It might go with you to the grave. But as long as you are repenting of that, and confessing it, and fighting against that passion, you will be saved. Therefore, especially in these days of the great fast, be weary and be alert. Because it is this time that, in particular, uh, these things are somehow exalted within ourselves in order for us to meet the great resurrection with a pure heart and a pure mind and a pure soul and a pure body that we normally do. It's a preparation. It's a preparation for the kingdom of heaven, preparation for the great resurrection, and a preparation that we are on the right side of Christ and not on the left when the great judgment occurs. Because it's up to our own free will to do this. Strange thing, this free will. We think we can do just about anything with it. And we dream about it, especially when we are young. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to become this, I'm going to become that. And you see, suddenly or slowly, that no matter how you try, it's not working the direction you want your free will. Why? Because you pray that you want to be saved. And therefore the Lord directs your free will along a path to salvation. Don't pray about it. And you can become a relationship to the Rothschilds. Like it said in the gospel today. Fortune the prophet of man, if he should gain the whole world, lose his soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There are people in the world today that do own the world in a sort of a sense. But they are ashamed of Christ and his words and are adulterous and sinful. And when Christ comes, he will be ashamed of them. And as you know, it's even difficult to talk about where their end might be. May God protect us from these things and give us that wisdom to discern what we as fallen human beings need to do wanting to save our souls and wanting to, to walk the righteous path. God help us, preserve us and protect us in this great feast and fast days of our world.